Hello everyone, today we talk about the war of the third coalition from the putting in motion, in fact, of the same, and of the French reaction up to the surrender of the Austrian army at Ulm uh, that had been, in fact, uh, surrounded by Napoleon at that point, effectively managing to sever it from Vienna and from the Russian reinforcements of Kutsov that were uh, about to, to arrive. And so scoring a massive um, strategic uh, success uh, that, you know, I, I, I won't spoil anything for the sake of the series, but you know how history went eventually. And this feat is especially the, the crossing of, of the Black Forest and this massive willing um, towards the right of the entire French army so the, um, from the various Rhine crossings is, you know, one of the manualistic um, basics, let's say, of, of military history that today will not perhaps deal um, with in the, you know, radical detail that this operation would deserve. Um, this video, again, is part of a broader focus that I decided to make on this specific War of the Third Coalition, but we will have properly to enter Napoleonic warfare at some point in, in much more thorough way. Some of you have asked me uh, about that, so I'm glad that even though I'm just a humble medievalist, you are interested in my Napoleonic warfare videos. In spite, of course, there is a lot of stuff out there. Um, I try to, you know, spark a little with the medieval stuff just because it's my field of expertise and I'm aware there is much better content out there, especially much more entertaining one. But this series I began because I would like to stress in many ways a bit of method and a bit of uh, strategic uh, analysis uh, example in this regard. Um, and specifically towards the, mm, focusing towards the moment of the decision, that is to say what were practically the options available to the various uh, commanders and um, essentially showing, of course, not just the mistakes, but trying to make train a little bit also our own minds relatively to this concept. Uh, many of you follow me um, since I had already stopped the von, von Kriege um, reading and commentary that I have to resume at some point was very useful, but let's say for reasons that uh, I don't, I won't digress on. I, ha I stop m just momentarily. Um, but you know that in in the in in on war there is a lot, of course, of of reference to uh, Napoleonic warfare. Not much as a broader case of study because the book, uh, the I mean, the work is not. Um, fundamentally about that, but given that, of course, that represented in von Clausewitz's times the single most important um, strategic uh, example ever existed historically, um, it um, brought with itself uh, an enormous didactic example and value. So we naturally speak from 200 years afterwards, and not just we have, of course, assessed everything that they had to, um, in fact, to be assessed about Napoleonic warfare. That, of course, can be revisited in some way, but, like, it's one of the m top most studied stuff ever. And, and don't think that, again, we have such an overwhelming uh, av amount um, of information that can't be dominated at a point um, f by a single person to express some broader, you know, if anything, methodological, perhaps exactly, uh, for this video's sake, mm, impression, and maybe comparing it with uh, what von Clausewitz said in a theoretical sense, etc. Um, there are considered things that, uh, let's say, were refined also during the 19th century in the historiographical interpretation of these battles and so on, so it's uh, a it always goes on, but naturally also for what concerns all the warfare that we have witnessed up to this day that uh, as von Clausewitz explains never never actually changes right and and this is not uh, just a provocation, but it's a sound assessment properly about the, the 
what war is, right, and how it is fought. Right? So uh, I think it's incredibly important for a military history channel that wants to be one, even though, of course, there is plenty of uh, general history that very often attracts more than these things, um, the the chance of, of assessing why, why is that we even focus on things like strategy? And um, also given that we rarely talk about strategy per se, we mostly talk about tactics. Um, because that's the cut that I gave to my channel because strategy is very complex. In fact, it, it takes me a mini series just to cover the war, uh, the war of the, of the uh, third coalition. And you understand how big the thing is because strategy connects itself, of course, with tactics, but also with, as we'll see, and as we've seen in the introductory video, uh, lots of things that. Um, the, the the root of which cannot really be said okay well you know it's just this word is the you know the army corps and, and this is the map of Europe and that's it right you have to understand why this was happening um, of course realizing how much politics controls the whole thing and so you should be acquainted in general to, to the world background politically culturally uh, historically and so on and that's that that takes time. It takes a lot of time, and very often certain, say, strategic measures cannot even be satisfactorily uh, uh, assessed, or at least they, they can, but they require, again, an expertise that falls completely out in certain cases of, you know, the, the same military historical one. So that's why I care about the method, aside from the, the you know, properly strictly military in this case, strategic, because we will not look at tactics practically. Um, um, it, you know, it's, it's relevant and important. So as we've seen in the other video, the Third Coalition had finally made the decision to wage war on Napoleon. And it had been a very difficult one, as we were just saying, for political reasons, essentially. Um, These were essentially Austria, um, Russia... Naples, Britain had been threatened by the Armée d'Angleterre that Napoleon had gathered, in fact, to, to land um, in England, and that was instead shifted to the, the continental allies. Uh, Prussia had not entered the coalition uh, because of uh, problems that it had had with, with Britain concerning uh, the, the, the rights over Hanover and, and so on. We will partly see what effect this would have in following videos. Because throughout all this operation that I won't spoil you anything about, but say if you know that the theater of operation, Prussia m did mobilize eventually. Anyway, um, there were naturally other questions involved. We've seen this was part of a broader world strategy. Uh, in any case, um, the um, and, and there were generally speaking, uh, attritions within the same third coalitioners. I mean, Austria didn't like uh, Russia and vice versa at all. Uh, the same is valid uh, with Britain, with Russia. I mean, nobody likes Russia, let's be honest about that. Um, but, uh, of course, the Tsarist Empire would play a, a massive role, as you know, in the Austerlitz campaign. Um, and uh, and there are other myths, such as, for example, the problems connected with the uh, alleged discrepancy between the, uh, in fact, the, the two system, the, the two calendars, like the Julian and the, the Gregorian one. But that's been often, you know, said that it was a myth. But it, you have to understand that the massive difficulties, of course, of shifting hundreds of thousands of men across. Central Eastern Europe um, in the early 19th century. Um, in any case, even more complex than this situation, paradoxically, and you know that that goes against the sake of simplicity, which is one of the principles, classical principle of war, was the elaboration of the plan of operations. It took two seasons, the spring and summer of 1805, um, and um, it ended essentially in a compromise um, that, yes, did bring all parties to agreement, but still um, showed several problems, both politically and uh, strategically. 
Uh, the coalition, of course, could count on some strategic advantages uh, in, in general, right? For example, the maritime power of Great Britain. So the fact that up to that point, as we've seen, the uh, Grand Armée had been coastally displaced on the Manche, um, and, uh, of course, there was so a possibility of, of course, countering the same crossing that that was the main problem Napoleon had and this is witnessed well by his you know tense um, communication with Villeneuve but also this the, the, uh, consistent advantage was provided by the great human potential made available uh, by you know the coalition also chiefly through mm, the Russian ally that had invested greatly in this in this, uh, in this alliance to try to pressure Britain, maybe uh, accept partial uh, Russian expansion in Scandinavia, where uh, the Royal Navy got most of it, the wood for her ships from, and other issues also with the same Austria, especially regarding the great sick, the Ottoman. Um, another important advantage was the central position of Austria with respect to the two privileged scenarios of the war, right? And specifically Italy and Germany. So as you know, the Habsburgic Empire at this point stretched over um, a significant part of, of uh, Central Europe and Northern Italy, uh, the Habsburgic dynasty had you know, big ties all over the, um, uh, you know, the, the area, the, the, the peninsula and Germany that is the access to the same Austria and of course the the still the existence that still at this point is that the third coalition would bring to an end of the Holy Roman Empire uh, as such so, so uh, Italy and Germany had been considered up to that point in fact the weak areas of Europe because they were all fragmented and had been a significant penetration as you know of both uh, in, in the two countries of the uh, of the French the Jap uh, Jacobine ideas and at least there were some um, French allies of, of Napoleon, uh, including the same uh, Bavaria. So um, uh, there was the Austrian neighbor. So it was obvious that the, the coalition fundamentally rested on the, the main interests of Austria, that was the most immediately threatened member, uh, at least on the continent, by the uh, by French expansionism. So France, as we've seen in the other video, had managed essentially to expand it with for their natural uh, directions that is the Rhineland and Italy right and uh, as you know uh, there had been a sort of uh, eventually compromise where we share both regions by the French and the Habsburgs in the previous um, in the as, as a settlement for the previous wars um, and the army that was being deployed against France Altogether, because of the the, the compact um, uh, power was assembled, had never been so powerful and dangerous for for the French um, and for Napoleon in this case. So the the main point was essentially were to threaten Napoleon from. So the coalition had the initiative on the continent this partly had to distract the French from landing in Britain uh, and thus there was uh, uh, there was a choice inside that is to say where would the third coalition army intervene the most right there were different options in a sense um, and as we will see, the Habsburgs managed to convince the Allies that uh, essentially Italy was the most important theater um, strategically. Um, this was a wrong assumption, as we will see, uh, because, um, of course, mm, having Italy as the main theater of operations by controlling the Grand Armée um, in other areas uh, of Europe uh, could essentially contain the, the the maneuvers and then also hit France when the when the Russian army would would have arrived right that was most of the apps were, were were awaiting for but threatening central Germany seemed the most important um, 
uh, objective, right? With the greatest number of forces available, especially, and hopefully taking uh, Italy as a secondary scenario. And so thus decisively moving on to the offensive in Alsace upon the arrival of uh, the Russian reinforcements. And consider that the British could, uh, at that point, hand the French army being partly distracted towards um, the eastern uh, border, right, even attempted to even invade France themselves. Uh, and so uh, carrying out a bit what had been, had been happening, as you know, during the, the wars, uh, the revolutionary wars, uh, where France was attacked on, on three, um, if not four fronts at a time, still also thanks to Napoleon in Toulon, um, had, uh, had resisted. There would have been other options, such as, you know, attacking with determination distant and peripheral fronts, such as, you know, moving from Naples or Anova uh, to essentially trying to divide the French forces and taking advantage of, of um, numerical superiority. Um, and also a strong army in northern Germany would have uh, served as a warning and a push to Prussia um, in the in in the in the wall, but the best move definitely would have been um, Central Germany because there the uh, the mass of the Allies would have essentially countered with significant superiority the French forces, and so uh, that full advantage would have been uh, more directly employed, and so it would have been also the the, the least expensive of the. Um, uh, of the of, of all of these plans. Um, however, and this is the point, the Habsburgs absolutely wanted to reconquer Italy after it had been invaded by the French during the wars of uh, the revolutionary wars and albeit they controlled the northeast of it, they still you know felt threatened from there. as you know, Napoleon uh, could have even at some point pushed through Tyrol into Austria herself. Um, while camping in, in the Po Valley, so um, there was uh, a general, uh, say, exposure to the um, to were properly the, the French Italian forces um, it, that uh, Austria felt the need to uh, to counter, also to reacquire important control in the peninsula and access to the Mediterranean, free of of any other uh, you know of interference uh, and threat, which would have been also very important to partly counter the Mediterranean, um, in fact, uh, projectional capacities of Russia that uh, you know, inter did intervene, in even the same Italy, navally speaking, as you know, during the Napoleonic Wars. Um, so, um, the, um, the, the Habsburgs decided to resume offensive on Italian soil, and um, as they, they they had done in 1796-97 and also in 1800. To this end, the best uh, soldiers of the Austrian Empire, 95,000, were entrusted to Archduke Charles, right, the Count of Teschen, the most military talented in very large uh, Austrian family. Um, the, the emperor had fundamentally 13 siblings uh, and that's you know as you know the Habsburgs have always been particularly prolific but especially during Napoleonic Wars you know that military talent was not exactly a major trait in fact the Count of Teschen was one of the few uh, generals that would be able to defeat Napoleon um, himself later on at a point but for the rest and as we will see also in this same campaign it didn't particularly spark um, of, of um, boldness and um, spirit of uh, enterprising spirit, let's say. Um, so these 95,000 men had the task of crossing the Adige River and penetrating deeply into the Po Valley in the direction of Milan. That was French. And another imperial brother, Johan, would have instead been stationed in Tyrol at the head of 33,000 men, forming what was at least conceived in the Habsburg, in the Allied plan as, a, as an ideal bridge between Charles in Italy and his third brother Ferdinand in, in Germany. Um, as we'll see, 
this decision doesn't seem particularly sound from a strategic point of view because Tyrol was nor particularly significant in that situation, nor it was under threat, right? You know, uh, Vienna was more exposed had the French won in, in, in Germany or even in Italy. Um, and so the the question there would have been to actually replenish both fronts without this kind of health force in the middle that, yes, could use as a, or be used as a reserve, but could be done so also in the in the other and the other fronts. Now, um, Ferdinand, assisted by General Mack, Karl um, Mack von Leibrich von Freiherr, ha, um, that would be in fact the command there in, in chief of the, uh, the entire Habsburgic army at that point, had to enter Bavaria, uh, crossing the border on September the 10th with 17,000 men and a double task that was to exert strong pressure on the elector of Bavaria, that as we've seen was an ally of Napoleon, and to block the passes um, in the chain of the Jura Mountains, forming essentially a screen um, that would have uh, hidden the arrival of the Russians, right? That would have advanced through Vienna, the Danube Valley, um, reaching the 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 Habsburgs in in Bavaria, so that the French would have been put in great difficulty, as we see now. To you know, at least that's what the Austrians expected, uh, for having a major obstacle uh, in the Jura Mountains in the same Danube, and in that sense, not even realizing what at, at which point the Russians were in the march, because this was also literally, uh, as you know, an important matter of timing, right? How much would it take for a functional army to cover such huge distance? It could have even marched much faster, but uh, there was a, a cohesion that had to be maintained, and the Grand Armée would surpass everyone in this in this situation. And we'll see how, but that is obvious, has obviously to do with the, the French army. Um, as a whole, I, I, last year on the uh, um, 200th um, year uh, anniversary of Napoleon's death. I made a video about uh, Napo Napoleon's uh, contribution to the, the art of war and we've seen essentially in, in what the French revolutionary and Napoleonic armies were qualitatively superior to the one, uh, essentially to anybody else, because both of the century-old French military culture and properly terrestrial superiority and you know, on a certain praxis for example you know French ar armies were habituated to march just much faster than uh, the others uh, by training but it was a matter of military culture since uh, France had always had to defend essentially a continental frontier and they had to beat um, the other armies in, on, on time in that sense but of course and especially also the same essence of the revolutionary armies that had unlocked the masses, in fact, of hundreds of thousands, that the still, um, you know, conservative, if not reactionary, powers in Europe were trying not to, um, you know, to emulate in that kind of, you know, necessary extension that would have entailed to uh, rights of the masses and their consequence levy and motivation and so on. So all of this, of course, was a was a clash uh, of tight hands, but with very different. Uh, cultural background, so this influenced even things as strategy and tactics, of course. Um, uh, the Russian army was proceeding in three columns, staggered from south to north on parallel roads. Um, the first contingent of 35,000 Russians under Kutuzov's command moved along the southernmost road and was expected in um, in Bavaria for October the 20th, this was the, sp the spearhead, uh, closely followed on a median path by the 40,000 men of Buch's Hoveden column, um, and a third contingent, the northernmost one of 20,000 men, led by uh, Benningsen, with the task of controlling the moves of the unreliable Prussians, and if necessary also to be able to protect themselves against Napoleon. In the meanwhile, a mixed British, Russian, Napole Neapolitan force uh, 
Um, the latter also composed by the brigands slash guerrillas of Fra Diavolo in the San Felicity of Cardinal Rufo that, as you know, had essentially carried out a uh, significant guerrilla in southern Italy against French occupation um, in the previous years would have um, energetically ascended uh, the whole peninsula to break into the uh, strategic scenario of the Po Valley. And the King of Naples, by the way, had been pretty much wavering at that point um, and with singular timing he declared war on Napoleon uh, actually four days before <laughs> the same the same Ulm right um, that is too late to be of any use but just in time to ruin himself by attracting Napoleon's ire um, and at, at that point considered that the Bourbon army was, was still within the borders of the same Naples right when the news from Pomerania even reached uh, him um, and this is um, interesting because it shows also what was the the Allies situation as we will see essentially the French managed to cross the Rhine without the the Austrians even realizing that right so consider how information recognition uh, intelligence worked uh, at the time these were still kind of relatively primitive times, co communication-wise, and um, organization, even on that front, was really everything. Um, so, in any case, overall, n nearly 450,000 men were preparing to move against France. Right? It was a, 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 impre a really impressive number, al almost half a million soldiers. Um, However, as we've seen too, still the these imposing figures um, hide a reality full of errors and of contradictions. So first of all, also in in perspective, the Allied strategic plan was nothing but the bubbling of those of the two uh, the two previous campaigns. Therefore, it was even too well known to Napoleon, right? If you wanted to surprise the guy, you had to invent something more original, right? And with such massive forces, of course, the best way, as we've seen, would have been just rather going straight against him uh, without this, in fact, split uh, between this unbalancement towards Italy that we've seen um, being pushed by, by the, the Habsburgs. Uh, also, another point is that uh, a perfect coordination mechanism for almost half a million men was indispensable, right? Uh, you, you cannot uh, realize such a complex and articulated plan without, without uh, also uh, uh, an, an agile um, system of command, right? On a front that covered basically the whole of Europe from north to south. Uh, and the reality was quite different and characterized instead by even paradoxical shortcomings. We've seen that the, prob the, the problem of the calendar's synchronization uh, as the Austrians had adopted the Gregorian uh, one while the Russians were basically the only European country left to still use the Julian calendar. Uh, and in, according to this, again, it's just an anecdote. Some, some historians have been quite vocal against it, but this would have made still the Russian 12 days behind their allies. Uh, thus, the Austrians found themselves essentially unbalanced, forward too, and without the support of the Russian reinforcements. Uh, another shortcoming that would prove to be far more damaging than the previous one in the long run was the extreme confusion in the command structure. It should have been adamantine. Like, in fact, it was foreseen that Kutuzov had to carry out the instructions that were given to him by the members of the imperial family and only by them. In other words, no Austrian officer would have had to have an authority over the Russians because the orders had to proceed along this pre precise hierarchical process and only through that, right? So instead then, you know, facilitating the task, this, because uh, of course these were political decisions taken in the capitals, they had to travel, etc. This would actually harm 
the uh, that same kind of straight um, uh, control that this would have ha had to allegedly produce, right? As if it were not enough, um, the the Emperor Francis II had ordered his brother Ferdinand to follow the directives of General Mack in, in Germany, uh, whom he considered, in fact, more expert than his brother in military matters, which also didn't quite help because, in theory, was still Ferdinand to be uh, in charge, whereas, you know, to carry, take care of operations was actually Mack. This produced some some attrition. Um, it's difficult to imagine a more chaotic command structure such high level, right? For Napoleon, this thing did not exist, simply because um, he had a single and centralized responsibility. He commanded from, of course, the, the front, um, and everything was in his uh, full control, right? And you know about Napoleon's ego and incredible moral forces to take the kind of political and military decisions that th this whole thing um, entailed, as we will see also having just decided altogether quite quickly to shift the um, the, the Grand Armée from the project of, uh, the, of invading Britain to this Central European theater is reflects that kind of um, iron nerves. Um, Finally, as we were saying before, nobody really understands what that uh, 30, uh, 23, excuse me, thousand men of Archduke John, uh, Johan uh, in Tyrol would have really meant, right? Soldiers undoubtedly wasted on, on those mountains that where no one would have posed them anyway, right? So why they would have been much more precious elsewhere. Uh, in fact, they would remain virtually inactive throughout the the campaign. So, trying in vain to gain a, an opponent to fight against, uh, paradoxically. Um, so, passing to the French side, Napoleon's plan was to make history and school right. Even the Schlieffen plan during World War the First. But the German side was inspired to this um, wheeling, uh, in that case, to the left rather to the right, but, uh, you know, also with actually disastrous consequences, uh, as you know. Uh, and the French emperor at this point was very careful. I mean, this was definitely not... Uh, it would be a an actual walk in woods, right? Keep mentioning the, the epic march across the, the Black Forest. Uh, but it was definitely not uh, a child's play, let's, say, let's put it in this way. And, of course, the the amount of the enemies was, was impressive. Napoleon had evidently been caught uh, off guard by that point. Um, there's been some historiographical debate about this, but we'll refer to it later. Um, given that his armies were, at the moment of, you know, the... The enemy mobilization was scattered over a very large area. Right, the uh, Armée d'Angleterre was far from the eastern frontier. Right, they're on the march. Uh, Marshal Bernadotte occupied Anova with the first corps, about seventeen thousand men. Marmont was in the Netherlands with the second corps that is 15,000 French and 5,000 Dutch. In Bavaria, Napoleon could count on 25,000 uh, 25, between Bavarians and Baden-Württembergers. In northern Italy, Massena commanded the 50,000 men of the Italian army, while in the Neapolitan, um, Gouvion Saint-Cyr had 20,000 at his disposal. Yet, Napoleon, after having tackled the problem of numerical inferiority by issuing a decree of compulsory conscription for 150,000 young people, right, the Jeunesse Dorée, and for the first time actually experiencing um, 
draft evasion at warring levels, he was uh, ready to overturn his original approach with an alternative plan that exploited to the maximum the um, weaknesses uh, inherent in the enemy attack, as we've seen. So, and this decision, as we're seeing, was so sudden that more than one scholar hypothesized that the going as far as that that frankly is debatable that the whole project of the invasion of England and the dispersed deployment of the French troops were nothing but smoke and mirrors to attract the Allies uh, in a trap already thought of for some time uh, and um, the reason why I think this is the case is that at least we have many testimonies handed down to us um, regarding the anxiety with which Napoleon awaited for the, the news of Admiral Villeneuve that had, as we've seen in a previous video, did the, the vital task essentially of finding, of, of tricking actually the Royal Navy um, to buy enough time for the French army to cross the channel into England. Uh, and so the thing was to be uh, to be done and as bold as it was really um, as you know things would go wrong for for the French and Spanish Navy and for Villeneuve uh, himself that you know what and he made pretty obscurely after that failure uh, in any case we will see that uh, in another on another occasion Napoleon's plan here had some options, as we've seen, just as the Allies could decide in which operational theater that they could they could act. So Napoleon there had to to respond, but you know, uh, deciding the uh, the the, act, the the single relative proportions. Um, so Charles, uh, Archduke Charles in Italy, um, was definitely protecting the higher interests of the Habsburgs, right? And an advantage of attacking there would have had that the Russian reinforcements would have taken more time to get in the Pop Valley. Um, then there was, in theory, also another option, that is, that was the British army in Anova, because um, these were some of the the closest adversaries of France, as we've seen in the grand plan for world domination. Um, so the most politically dangerous ones as well, and they could use their presence in Anova to still, you know, manage to, to curry favor with the Prussians that naturally were, were somewhat freaking out that the entire Germany was to be engulfed in this mess. Uh, the main target, however, that in fact Napoleon nailed was Mac in Germany, right? Because um, the Austrian army in Bavaria represented the actual Schwerpunkt of the Allied strategic deployment, so a rallying point towards which the Russian armies were marching, and so imagine taking out uh, I don't spoil or anything, the Austrian army, would, what consequences would have had, given that, as we've seen, the Austrians were on, on the fore in that continental, broader continental theater. Um, so, um, waiting for the enemies on the Rhine, where the Russians would arrive worn out by the long march, while the French one would be fresher and reinforced by new records, was that as we've seen were, were, uh, were being conscripted was, um, was an important advantage as well. And in fact, Napoleon chose to attack in Germany, notoriously enough. Uh, we know that he had anticipated the intentions and movements of the Austrians as early as August the 13th. That day... Napoleon predicted that the 
allies would renew their attack along the lines of the previous coalitions, sending an army to block the passes of the Schwarzwald between Ulm and Memmingen and attacking in Italy. The Austrians had not understood that in the wars of the first and of the second coalition only contingent events, um, for example the dispute with um, General Moreau had distracted Napoleon from the properly cased on of, of the continent, right, central Europe. Now instead Napoleon had free reigns there uh, until remember that right uh, Napoleon's uh, success in Italy was essentially the consequence of the fact that he was still considered um, you know secondary uh, figure militarily speaking albeit uh, you know politically prominent and dangerous so uh, the he had been kept away from the French army of the Rhine right and sent to actually surprise everyone uh, the same Paris, um, not just um, uh, Vienna in the process, by, in fact, uh, destroying the Austrians and even threatening uh, their, their, their capital. Um, until August the 23rd, 1805, Napoleon had not yet lost all hope of seeing Villeneuve arrive with the fleet to be able to invade England. As we've seen, Napoleon, as a military genius that he was, was um, terrestrially so, right? He didn't have much of a of an understanding of of naval warfare to to realize that fleets do not move with the mathematical precision of land armies, right? Uh, and the the situation was enormously complicated by the uh, massive qualitative superiority of the Royal Navy uh, in the first place. Um, but the Emperor had a clear sense of time passing. He would say that famously in his memoir that time was really more important. Um, and on the 26th the marshals read to the French troops such proclaims from the Empereur that sounded something like quote valiant soldiers of the Boulogne camp where the Armée d'Angleterre had been assembled awaiting for embarkment you will not go to England the gold of the English seduced the Austrian Emperor who declared war on France his army has surpassed the positions in which it was to remain Bavaria is invaded. The soldiers, new laurels await you on the other side of the Rhine. Let's go and conquer the enemies we have already vanquished. Uh, in this same proclamation, Napoleon baptized his army the Grande Armée. That's when it properly happened. And in fact, um, the French uh, forces would remain so for the next 10 years of uninterrupted wars. General Mack, however, appeared uh, unassailable, right? protected by the Black Forest, the Jura Mountains and the Danube, could safely await in a sound defensive position the arrival of the Russians. So a race against time began for the French that didn't have, as you understand, to lose even uh, a day. Uh, in the process, because when the Austrians would have joined force with the Russians, things would have been much more complicated. So, there were also here some specific strategic choices for Napoleon available. Um, and they had to do with properly how to attack southern Germany. Um, there were, in fact, um, different ways that this could, could happen. Crossing the Rhine between Strasbourg and Basel, blocking essentially the passes of the Black Forest and then reaching the Danube from, from the south, which was pretty bold. Crossing the Rhine further north, that is bypassing the Black Forest instead by crossing the Danube far to the east and then enter Mac and a 
um, uh, and the uh, upcoming Kutuzov in between, crossing the Rhine in the middle, joining forces in Bavaria by attacking Mack as quickly as possible. Now, on this occasion, Napoleon displayed all his pure military genius, right? It, it would not be only to be una unobtainable, but even unthinkable. Consider that, importantly, um, Napoleon's plan would have not been attainable or even thinkable without that exceptional war machine that the Grande Armée was, right? Um, its perfect organization in corps, the excellent command of the marshals, the inestimable contribution of the officers, the perfect training and the high morale of the of the soldiers, the grognard, as the you know the 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 top, in fact, uh, final rank trooper uh, of of the time, um, and we have explained again in in the previous video to this and also the one on Napoleon's contribution to the art of war what that French military cultural superiority substantiated itself from and and marching briskly on parallel roads Napoleon chose the second option right he marched briskly on parallel roads right um, essentially aiming the Grand Armée directly at Max rear to hit him from behind after cutting his line on communication with Vienna and Kutuzov. Right? This was a calculated risk because basically put French army, uh, let's say, you know, significantly um, in enemy territory and exposing her own flanks to the possible arrival of the Russians, but he was effectively cutting. Uh, the entire uh, communication line is, was the the Danube one uh, of the of of Max army, right? So, for the Austrians, the Black Forest was transformed from a shield into a curtain, right? And while their attention was distracted with well coordinated diversionary actions behind that strategic screen, the French army would be able to perform. Uh, a complex maneuver, unnoticed, right? A brilliant reworking of the classic scheme of the maneuver sur le derrière, right? A strategic action um, that had already yielded Napoleon victories, such as at those of Mondovi, Lodi, Arco, and Marengo, um, that consisted in essentially pinning uh, down the, the enemy with some diversionary maneuver while essentially outflanking him. And this of course it was a, an important strategic risk because outflanking the enemy still entails the stretching of your uh, communications like, like in this case and uh, the difficulties of coordinating especially the larger force that Napoleon would privilege in fact in using for this maneuver but that was in fact um, providing in the French case with an important time advantage which is exactly also what the, the French now had to strategically gap before the Russians arrived, um, in, in order to also catch by surprise the enemy was not habituated with that kind of speed. And as we will see, in fact, the entire uh, plan was practically not even realized by the Austrians until they saw the French arriving in, in their in their in their face. So in rare. So the the question here is how good would have been the Grande Armée to maintain its cohesion functionality in such a long uh, range and and fast march right in enemy terror which they performed brilliantly against again any expectation and uh, revealing that enormous success of French military culture at that point um, and Napoleon thus succeeded to insinuate in insinuating his army behind the enemy forcing him to fight in, in disadvantageous conditions. And as we'll see, the Battle of Ulm was not even properly a, a battle in the broader sense, because the, the Austrian army wouldn't even fight uh, at large. Right, so, a, as a first measure that was definitely a 
a warring sign for the troop, but still, you know, the uh, you know the realization that what they had been training for what was there finally, and that that's a very important thing from a moral point of view. Uh, Napoleon made sure that each soldier was supplied with two pair of boots. It would be consumed like hell. Um, we know the French marched even during sleep, right? Uh, following each other in row um, and performing this magnificent stunt. And also a new overcoat, right? Uh, because still this in fact entailed, you know, entering Germany in, uh, as we will see, that would have been in October in the end. So, you know, not excessive uh, weather strains, but still something that they had to rely on minimally on the longer run. And you know that after two months of campaign, basically your own uniform doesn't exist anymore. Um, so these measures were quite well thought uh, and they would be needed, um, in fact. Um, since August the, the 25th, seven streams of men leave their bases from, uh, each with a specific destination so the first core that is Bernard, uh, Bernadotte um, 17,000 men left Hanover to point on the Main River to Würzburg then crossed the Ansbach that was Prussian territory interestingly enough and th this will have interesting consequences later on in campaign um, on the other hand, however, already on September the 8th, the uh, entire Bavarian army, that is 26,000 men commanded by uh, the Roi, had taken refuge in Ansbach. In other words, they had um, retreated as at the Austrian advance. The second corps, 20,000 Franco-Dutch as we've seen, commanded by Marmont, followed a path parallel to the previous one and headed for Mainz. The third corps, Davout 26,000, which was uh, stationed at Ambleteuse, that was on the coast, was the northernmost of the channel camps, marched towards Mannheim. The um, major corps, the 40 thousand men under the order of Su, the uh, the fort, left the huts and gardens that the soldiers had built at uh, Boulogne in the major camp uh, on the Manch and headed for Speyer. And alongside him uh, also coming from the Channel area, the 6th Corps, 24,000 men commanded by Nei, these would be really vital, uh, marched uh, towards Karlsruhe as a as a destination. The fifth corps, that is Lan, with eighteen thousand men, followed the southernmost route, starting from Etaples, together with the seven thousand men of the guard, commanded by Bessier, and ahead of them rode Murat, with his uh, first cavalry corps, right, the cavalry reserve. Um, 22,000 horsemen um, as the vanguard of the Grande Armée. Last but not least, behind the wall system, followed the 7th Corps of Augereau, 14,000 infantry only, which would perform the function of rearguard, protecting the very long and stretched lines of communication. This was, again, a major issue but you realize that the French managed to logistically support all this which is extraordinary nothing short of um, only 45,000 French soldiers would remain on the Manche specifically 30,000 in Boulogne so at the major camp with Brune and 15,000 um, actually in the Netherlands under the orders of Louis Bonaparte to prevent any English landings, uh, meaningfully enough. Uh, of course, the, the British were looking at um, any possibility there to, you know, uh, relief uh, 
the allies by opening another another front hopefully uh, in the back of the French uh, which the Austrians somewhat counted particularly on at some point it also deluded themselves what was actually happening why they had actually been surrounded by the French uh, the world movement um, of the French army by the way was covered by the utmost secrecy the French borders were closed uh, the press didn't have any news to publish the marshals themselves received only the information strictly necessary to carry out their tasks so it was just Napoleonic mastermind there behind all of it um, also there were naturally as um, fake news contradictory n rumors about the destinations of the core um, artfully spread right and even um, in the advance campaign there was a talk of uh, let's say joint maneuvers or alternation of unity so the truth was always kept hidden right the French managed to um, to shelter themselves pretty well uh, informationally too uh, on September the 24th Murat and Lannes had um, crossed the Rhine at Strasbourg, Strasbourg if you prefer, and entered the Schwarzwald to carry out a demonstration action against the Austrians. It was the red herring. Massena in Italy, in meanwhile, was exerting uninterrupted pressure against the almost double numbers of uh, Archduke Charles. And the latter was disconcerted, right? The, throughout the course of the campaign, as we were saying before, he would behave in a somewhat um, renouncing and abulic way that is certainly inferior to his fame. It happens that great commanders in certain situations wouldn't um, really spark for some reason. Uh, and the Austrian forces in, on that occasion were undoubtedly disadvantaged by the strategic use made of essentially a, a by taking a cordon line right distributing their forces over the entire extension of the front thus Massena even though being numerically in fear had a good game keeping his concentration instead always maintaining the initiative and thus essentially beating the Austrians uh, in detail um, and in fact in, in practice Charles um, was even more worried comprehensibly about Napoleon's skill um, in, in Germany and uh, was more constant concerned by the lack of news on the Empereur movements than by his own direct opponent uh, in the Po Valley and the obvious reason being that if the German army collapsed Vienna was to be seized by the French so it was game over for any other Habsburgic theater of operation um, that he had uh, smelt already on September the 26th the whole Grande Armée had already crossed the Rhine and the Austrians hadn't even noticed it the only information that um, concern in fact was the exploit of Murat uh, uh, in the Black Forest and the not very comforting course that the campaign of Italy was taking. Mack began to suspect something at that point already. He um, couldn't however believe his own insights because again the hypothesis uh, that um, one military doctrine unanimously at the time because it was never had never been done in history considered impossible could could not be accepted would not be believed like no strategic movement of a certain daring could involve more than 50,000 men they thought Napoleon was moving with 210,000 
so this was really a uh, you know that that gives you the 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 measure of the of the strategic and logistical effort and organization behind all this and what france could afford to do with the resources uh uh had been in fact unlocked um like a regiment on parade the seven columns of the french converge neatly towards their intended objectives right this is just the, like getrennt marschieren verein schlagen that the uh, the prussians would learn from their rather um you know painful experience during the napoleonic wars um so basically in 12 days the french had the war 350 kilometers while maintaining all their fighting efficiency intact right a real logistical miracle to say the least um which um would however be uh even overcome by the french during this campaign because you know what happened with the march throughout uh, bohemia and when napoleon's troops are spotted near the danube mac was deeply perplexed um and still couldn't fully realize the gravity of his position because even though you know yet the french were there but you know where did uh all they come from right how many others were there these were arriving gradually as you know and also um he didn't know where where the russians were so at that point so according to plans they they should have been already closed as a matter of fact they were already um would be already in germany but how much right it, it was time at this point to take an important decision right so even here um the Austrians were faced with with another um, with another choice to make. Um, that is to say, uh, from one side there could be um, an advantage of cavalry superiority with a quick strike, and then retreat before the French could react with a, an attack and quick strike, and then retreat before the French could react. Um, this choice would have been. Um, as you understand, also kind of a probably tactical one of some sort, um, and it would have been exploitable by uh, you know more very morally loaded and determined in fact force um, to delay uh, delay the French uh, also with the in part with the destruction of some bridges over the Danube, even though as we'll see the the French had enough crossings. And thus buying time for awaiting the arrival of Kutuzov, right? And this was, you know, a strategic choice, of, you know, of greater uh, level that, however, was not taken. Um, the the other one would have been to approach Archduke John in in Tyrol, that is to say, retreat, and plus, you know, sending that massive army that, after all, the the Austrians themselves um, had. That is several tens of thousands of men so basically retreating without doing anything getting into role starving with the other 23 um, thousand uh, uselessly employed troops uh, would have been nonsensical um, the choice um, that eventually the Austrians ended up to 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 make also because they they were not really realizing what was going on, so they lost time in the process, was concentrating forces in Ulm in view of the of a general counteroffensive. And albeit that that may seem like you know, yeah, because we're eventually to counter strike. The actual point is that they were being a uh, cut by the French, as we will see now, probably through um of their contacts through through the Danube, their supplies line. So um already you know, realizing that would have depressed the morale, and not even, as we will see, even bring to a, an actual counterattack, even if this was actually done. And in fact, the decision of Mack and Ferdinand was a wait and see one, because uh, the situation did have contradictory elements from their side, because certainly Napoleon had interrupted their primary line of communication with Vienna by that point, because they were beginning to cross the Danube to their east as well, in this kind of 
door that is closing on that and, and crossing the Danube. And the, the Danube route, um, but he had also, mm, the Emperor had also placed himself in the awkward position of turning his back on Kutuzov. And there were still troops approaching and there were still uh, English troops in Anova. We're not talking about the possibility of British landings in France uh, herself. So, as you understand, the French here were to um, simply invest as much as they could in uh, speed, because the quicker they would have surrounded the Austrians, the, the sooner, um, this would have collapsed before any reinforcement could be operationally useful to, to relieve them. Um, and the Austrians felt at that point that they had simply to concentrate the troops still available, about 55,000 men, in fact, in Ulm. Uh, the others had been already cut off from the uh, uh, lightning Napoleonic action. And meanwhile, the French army was in fact resolutely moving. On the night between the 6th and the 7th of October, the 2nd Division of the 5th Corps had captured the Donauwerth bridges intact, right? while Murat had taken possession of Münster. On the 8th, Murat also sent a division to take the bridge over the Lech River near Rhine, uh, and the Wall of Sul's 4th um, Corps was attached to the south bank of the Danube. On the French uh, army corps only Ney's eventually remained on the left flank of the Danube, serving as the pivot of this um, rotational movement, right, swinging, right, uh, that was closing a solid gate behind the Austrians and advancing and challenge up to seven kilometers northeastern of Ulm. Right. Um, and the rear was of, of the French army was protected, as we've seen, by the VII Corps and Allied contingents. At this point, Mack and Ferdinand could no longer ignore uh, the, the fact that they had been surrounded by the, the French army and um, that there was no way <laughs> the enemy was going to leave, uh, if not... Uh, counter-attacked and, and so uh, at that point the um, even distracting the bridges over the Danube that they still held um, would could could bring uh, to counterproductive results for the Austrians the, the French instead had an abundance of crossings in, in the first place um, Yet also Napoleon had to update his plans, not only preparing himself to the possible Austrian counterattacks, but especially because by now the arrival of the Russians had to be imminent, and therefore um, also the one of uh, starting a completely new phase of the campaign um, with it. Uh, so there were some options even here that the both the contendants at this point really had. Um, the, mm, the Austrians could launch a decisive attack along the north bank of the Danube to surprise the opponents, disorganizing them and then attempting a retreat towards Vienna. This was the, the best one because um, it still basically can uh, find a remedy for the mistakes that had been mm, ha that had happened up to that point. Um, the the other one could could be to initiating a more active form of resistance by identifying and targeting the French weak points, uh, is isolated units from from the rest of the army. But at the same time, it's not a broader plan, right? It lacks of the necessary energy to cope with the fact that still the enemy has cut your supply lines, it's too shy, let's say you can't, uh, it, it basically keeps the initiative in the hands of Napoleon that after all has more men, um, in spite of 
you know, maybe some tactical, um, relative tactical inferiority for cavalry and so on. Um, the other option would have been to escape encirclement by moving north while simultaneously cutting French lines of communication. Um, but this would have actually just cut the same the same Austrian ones, right? Um, and entering a territory that is also well defended by the French troops, so that was not to be uh, done in the first place. As from the French side, there were uh, some possibilities. One was, uh, one was abandoning the Austrians by surprise and um, forging uh, marches to, to Russians to give him battle in advance. Um, the, the first one doesn't probably see the point of it all because uh, you're essentially concentrated forces successfully to uh, of a divided uh, on um uh, on an enemy that is separated from from joining uh, forces with with reinforcement so uh, you would you wouldn't properly get uh, anywhere um the other which is what um, napoleon really thought was preparing to face the austrian enemy in a battle on the idla River um, with a flanking attack from from the south. Um, albeit this um, allowed the Austrians some local counterattacks against the French contingents north of the Danube. Well, the best one in insight would would have been to coordinate an attack from the north and south against the Austrians with Ney, right, taking advantage of the many crossings available on the Danube to maintain close relations between the the units um, and uh, this has the advantage of consolidating the strategic advantage by using combined uh, forces and it maintains the initiative also in the hands of the French without weakening any parts of the deployment um, and in fact it was uh, Napoleon at a point kind of overstated the Austrian um, the Austrian spirit, right? Um, the Austrians didn't have enough courage and energy uh, to start a decisive of offensive against the enemy. There were too few. First of all, you, you got to understand them. They had been caught by surprise. They didn't know practically even what was happening by a certain extent. And plus, th there were rumors, um, false ones, that the British had landed in Boulogne and that Napoleon would have had to hurry back um, on the same road that he had come from to even suppress counter-revolutionary mo movements in, uh, across France um, and um, it, it, it was too late actually like even if that had been true like assuming the, the British had literally landed in France and began to spark rebellions everywhere um, still the majority of forces that the coalition was to um, to, to deploy was in Central Europe and so the only way for Napoleon to save the situation would have been to still destroy um, the Austrians and the Russians on the field which is quite different from say what the the Austrians were in fact thinking Napoleon would do uh, not just in that case but also in in their broader mistake let's say of thinking that Italy was a more important theater than than Central Europe, right? Because if if they did so, like Napoleon would have had to invade Italy by and leaving the eastern French border unprotected from, you know, the, the army in Central Europe. I mean, this is at least what maybe they were also partly hoping that would happen. But of course, Napoleon understood that the schwerpunkt of the coalition was in Central Europe, and that's where he attacked and forced, and even in this sense, surprising everybody because they thought you know the French were puzzled by by their movement there were so many and so on but at the end of the day they dispersed forces instead of concentrating them just think about those um, the difference it could have made those 23,000 uh, soldiers in Tyrol right had they had they say managed altogether to 
successfully counter the French crossing in some spot and maybe um, uniting with the Russians at some point um, in time for the French finding themselves, uh, you know, in uh, the, the wall, you know, the majority of enemy forces in, in the front. Um, and, um, you know, w also with, with an army in part across the Danube and part not. Right? So these are the big decisions that in insight can really shift the entire strategic balance. So what happened just is that while the French were carrying out their entire maneuver that again was nothing short of, of extraordinary, the Austrians limited themselves to test the enemy resistance. Right? While they they were the ones that should have you know just pose them uh, if they had to do that to, to immediately counter them and mass and force right Napoleon was convinced as we were saying before that the Austrians pressed as they were they would have given battle uh, because objectively you know what would have you done anyway I mean if that army was to be cut out as it would uh, it was you know uh, lost anyway yes of course you know it would have been perhaps a bath of blood, but the only way to um, to escape the French grip would have been to try to break through, right? And in fact, uh, Napoleon had spotted the banks of the Illa River as the most likely position, in fact, in which the, the Austrians could have given battle to his forces. That's also the reason why Napoleon established his headquarters um, and operational center in Augsburg, um, on the um, in the east of the the, uh, the Austrian forces deploying the guard uh, there as well. Uh, meaningful enough, I mean the the French situation wasn't that um, reassuring uh, either. The uh, Empereur then ordered Murat and Lan to head towards Ulm, so to close in. Um, along the south bank of the Danube, so the right bank, uh, they had crossed, and so they had just to rise up the river and meeting with Mac forces. Um, acting in the meanwhile, in concert with Ney, who was on the north bank, uh, so he had still to cross. And so, with a wide loop through Landsberg and Memmingen, would have swooped down from the south on the flank of the Austrian side. A Bernadotte and Davou, assisted by the Roy, said had to go east, protecting the backs of, of the French army and sending explorers who finally, in fact, identified the position of the Russians. They were not far away. Um, the expected Austrian counterattack didn't happen. The decisions of the contenders, um, however, had a bloody effect as well. Um, in fact, on the 8th, uh, of October, a vanguard of Austrian troops heading towards Rhine collided with a division of French dragoons and was completely destroyed. This event, as von Clausewitz explains, which is just a, you know, an important event, but it's minor overall, um, but it did have remarkable moral effects, especially on Mack, who was stunned by the outcome of the fight. And um, from this moment on, the Austrian general actions would, in fact, be heavily affected by the blow. A few days later, think about this, Mac could make a comeback, surprising a French division that had remained isolated on the north bank of the Danube due to the um, reunification movement between the armies that was taking place, as we've seen, against the Austrians in the south. And the Austrian attack despite having been carried out by extremely superior forces, was not done so with the necessary energy uh, and, and, and due conviction. And, and in this way, the Austrians lost on that occasion the opportunity to make their way to Vienna in the process, because they could have exploited that gap to slip out the trap set by Napoleon at the last moment. And again, the French had salt on their tail because... They, uh, the, the Russians had effectively been spotted 
So at that point, the entire Rus uh, the, the entire Austrian army could have essentially um, uh, rushed out the French encirclement, or at least an important part of that, you know, by, say, sacrificing some units, by uh, allowing the others to, to disengage safely. Instead, this would, wouldn't uh, happen. Um, on the 14th of October, um, Napoleon had already corrected this erroneous approach because this mm, blood had been spilled um, in um, in the expectation of some in fact broader you know purpose as we've seen um, and um, in the mean the Russians were still 350 kilometers away so there was somewhat time yet um, this had been communicated by Bernadotte, who managed to acquire such news. Um, the this is just basically 10 days away, right? So it's not that much, uh, but enough at this point to close in on the Austrians. They were still, however, expected to 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 counterattack and mass. And again, they could have exploited this still moment of. French re of conversion to breakthrough, but they wouldn't. The Grand Armée had taken, as we've seen, 10 days to cover exactly 350 kilometers, by the way. Um, but the Russians that were wars would not be able to do it in twice as long, right? So that was also a bit the Russian deal. Lots of men, but definitely not of the same quality of, of the of the French ones, uh, and having even you know kind of half of the march speed of of the Grand Armée. Right. So, um, this would be a true turning point because the Austrians realized, first of all, it was too late to try to demolish the uh, Elchingen Bridge near Ulm. So much so that Ney will cover himself in glory by first coordinating the repair work on the bridge while under enemy fire, thus um, uh, gaining um, the for the action which he personally led the troops to storm eventually the same Ulm, quote, the bravest among the brave, right, and the appointment of Duke of Elchingen as in honor of that action, um, thus proving that, again, even that crossing that because th the Austrians were aware that he was he was there with the sixth corps but they hadn't taken enough measures to to prevent or to at least to delay Ney's crossing uh, nor to adequately protect Ulm as we've seen um, so the city was the, 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 the Austrian army was almost closed right um, after Elkingen the Austrian high command especially panicked, right? It, it was in chaos, um, and it was especially a, a dispute opening up because Mack was trying to impose his authority, um, and especially that the army had to remain united, while Ferdinand uh, was of the opposite opinion. He wanted at least the cavalry to be evacuated. This this force could have been uh, spent another day. Objectively, the situation was hopeless, right? And uh, in in uh, in all senses, because even though the insubordinate archduke, that as we've seen, uh, had been properly ordered by his brother, um, the emperor, to obey Mac fled um, uh, ha after having effectively broken the French uh, encirclement with uh, 6,000 cavalry but along the way still Murat uh, who had been pursuing them uh, mercilessly uh, with his superior cavalry force would capture them all except the Archduke who had already managed to you know he had abandoned his cavalry had already found shelter in Bohemia in the process. So it was a, a disaster. 
the Austrian army deprived even of that important cavalry element. Um, Murat himself uh, managed to take another 15,000 infantry prisoners because they had uh, they were nearby and they, they were also in this pretty you know hopeless situation. This brought to the French um, a booty of seven generals, 200 officers, 120 cannons and even the the wall army uh, treasure right but the decisive action was played in Ulm because the city as we've seen was surrounded the troops forced to reduce rations Mack had not lost hope that Kutuzov's columns would come to save him from the east and held on so by saying I don't care if we are losing pieces, if the French are attacking us from all sides, those damn Russians will, will arrive. Uh, and he said that it would have taken 20 days. On the 17th, um, he was forced to propose an agreement um, to Napoleon. Right? The Austrian troops would have surrendered after a week, assuming that the Russians would not arrive first, which is a way of saying, like, we will basically uh, hold on for our seven days um, and uh, if the Russians by that time have not arrived we will not uh, we will surrender we will not take a fight right and uh, the, the thing is kind of ironic because the Emperor accepted um, and Mac believed to have achieved this great diplomatic success but it would just take three days to realize that the situation was much worse than the one he had expected and that's why Napoleon agreed because on October the 20th finally five days before the date set by the agreement even and the Russians were far away still 30,000 Austrian soldiers including over 2,000 cavalry 60 guns 40 flags by the way fell into the hands of the French bringing the number of Austrian prisoners to 60,000. Do you know how many French died? 2,000. Like, speaking of a triumph is reductive. Basically an entire Austrian arm, uh, two corps as a matter of fact, were taken out uh, with a, a casualty ratio of 30 to 1. Uh, this is incredible, of course, um, and it's pure strategy, as you understand. Here, there was not even a, a battle fought. Right? The, the, the Austrians could have objectively uh, taken the field and, you know, uh, tried uh, to, to counter the French adequately, but they simply were paralyzed, right, psychologically, by the wall course of affairs they relied on essentially just hope right the Russians would arrive you understand that there was a sound logic behind it you know the the forces of Kutuzov after all were you know uh, almost 40,000 men so they were not really uh, you know just a few but the French had acquired such a, such an extraordinary uh, local advantage that you know the mere pressure was enough to make the entire uh, situation uh, degenerate and uh, the Russians took much more time they were expected to move as we've seen needless to say this will enormously influence the campaign in favor of the French who fundamentally secured the health of the Central European sector uh, in this way and that in fact significantly crippled the most important player uh, in the game after all that had as we've seen decided to disperse forces right in uh, especially in in southern Europe instead of concentrating them where the uh, where a decisive victory right it's a greater gamble yes it is like the greater thing but it's also the less risky because it's 
you know, otherwise you, you, you're you just complicating the situation by splitting forces and so that the enemy can't even defeat them in detail. And this is what they did even in a single regional theater in Italy where Massenade was kind of half of the Austrian forces was able to take on them just because they were all dispersed, um, you know, cordon, let's say. Um, and so this reveals you, of course, the extraordinary... Uh, uh, importance of an adequate planning excuse me I drink a little by even more but even more and this is the the strong piece of this all of how much nobody believed that the French could be able to carry out this magnificent operation with perfect timing with perfect organization with perfect let's say maintenance of their combat te capability even after an astonishingly uh, fast quick march um, in uh, partly hostile territory and also with significant risk again to be caught um, by two fires especially by the Austrians and the Russians in Bavaria but also on other fronts that would have significantly threatened um, the same stability of their uh, supplies in um, in uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, the the attack of the same uh, France uh, by the British and nor uh, the the four the, the one of the same from from Hanover and so on, um, and uh, that um, could have significantly uh, dispirited the army. Bite as we've seen, their morale was pretty high in the first place and the fact that they accomplished the same feat is not just again logistics this is you have to do this this depends on the sing on the will of the, of the single men that have to uniformly adequate and this reveals their motivation the determination their training partly also their equipment but this is primarily a matter of collective training and moral forces right and we will see how these factors will play further because this was just the beginning and the tides were turning in a quite disastrous ways against the third coalitioners and so the allies would now have to depend on a uh, you know they, they would essentially abandon the, the initiative as you know being chased by the French, either hoping that this would essentially wear them out uh, logistically in the process and you know how the Austerlitz campaign would culminate with the greatest uh, su success of Napoleon, a masterpiece and the in fact militarily speaking the highest point of, of Napoleonic glory. Uh, in any case we will hopefully see this soon in another video uh, I will try to make the video about the Battle of Alsa let's exactly on December the second. Um, for today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.